Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. Hi guys and welcome to the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast, a weekly show about all things Port Adelaide Footy Club. I'm your host, Macca19, and joining me, as always, as co-host, he's a little bit hungover, we're talking with Fishing Rick. How are you, mate? Uh, mate, I'm sitting here drinking my uh, my glass of wine, looking at it, thinking, is it half full or half empty? I, like I reckon it. it's half full. I'm gonna pour I reckon you it's one, half Macca. full as well. I'm going to pour you one. Do you want a half full one or are you a half empty type of guy? Mate, I'll definitely have a half full one. Well, then everyone should bloody cheer up. It's bloody depressing me reading the forum. Everyone should be half full instead of bloody half empty. Get this shit together. Absolutely. Well said. And for the first time on the podcast, we're speaking with Simba. G'day, boys. Thanks for having me on. No worries. Thanks for coming on. Now, first things first, let's find out a little bit about your Port background and uh, how you became a Port fan. Oh, yeah. Well, um... I was born into this, really. Um, my parents, my dad grew up in Port Adelaide. And, uh, you know, my uncles, my extended family, they all got to have Port Adelaide, like, as their local club. So it was, uh, I don't know, when I just grew up, I realised it was a privilege, you know, to, to have this AFL club as my, you know, kind of the club my family, my dad grew up supporting. And uh, I, reckon, uh, I reckon it was after the the bad grand final loss that we don't talk about is when I really started identifying with the club and started following us really closely about 07. Yep. I was 17. Uh, what about your favourite match? <laughs> yeah, my favourite match. That was a hard one. Um, oh, yeah, I thought of... Oh, I don't know. This doesn't... This can't really count. But remember that game in Brisbane like a few years back where we kicked like 10 goals in the first quarter? to their nothing or maybe one point or something. Yep. Yes. That was probably my favourite quarter ever because I think Salto was involved a lot in that. He kicked a couple and we were destroying just for that quarter. And we obviously lost as we knew we would at the time. Yep. We just knew somehow no matter what happened, we would give up those wins or those incoming wins. But I don't know. Yeah, that quarter stood out to me as just something I enjoyed so much, especially because I enjoyed watching Salto play. I brought uh, that up just the other just the other week. I reckon it was almost the the purest quarter of football I I can ever remember. Yeah, and a lot of people say the uh, prelim against Saints. So I'd have to say that as well because I was there and it was so good yeah. celebrating with those people I mentioned that uh, that I got to uh, inherit Port Adelaide from. They were going berserk. It was it was strange to watch as like a fourteen year old. <laughs> oh, I love it. What about your favourite player? Uh, my man, Tommy Logan. Yeah, I'm just going to stick with Tommy. Big Tommy. I like it. He, he's the man. I hope he's back after that killer performance. Watch out, uh, Fleur, the competition winner a couple of months ago. will be fighting with you. She's the number one Tommy Logan fan. I'll take her on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a showdown. Good stuff. All right. Well, let's get on to our love and hate. One thing we loved, one thing we hated about this weekend with Port Adelaide. Rick, I'll start with you, buddy. The friggin' cola, man. I'm pissed. I hate the cola. And I hate the fact that Buddy Franklin can just push people out the way and Buddy get a goal out of it. It just gives me the shits. I'm sick of being on the raw end of the umpiring decisions. And even though it didn't actually cost us the win, it made me feel like it did. So I'm going to okay. blame the friggin' umpires. So that's your love, I'm guessing? Was it? I thought you asked for my hate. <laughs> you love those the fluoro hate. maggots. The fluoro maggots. Screw <laughs> those fluoro maggots. Good work. And as for my love, um, look, it's a hard week to love anything, but I'm gonna I'm gonna love uh, Robbie Gray back to form. I tell you, that was that, talking about pure football. I, that was pretty close to pure football by Robbie Gray. The way that he's able to pick up the ball low, his disposal. If only we can just fix up his set shots on goal, you know, he would be, he'd almost be comparable to Gary Ablett at this point in time. But that's probably his chink in his armour at this point in time. But overall, what a, what a fantastic game by Robbie Gray. What about your love and hate, mate? Um, I'm doing Jakey Knee, don't I, for the love? Yeah, he, um, 
yeah, just seeing him back in the team is awesome. Uh, because I think he's such an important part of it. I think he should be playing AFL games. I'm sure the co- the coaches know more than us in terms of what we uh, what he should be doing at that level to get back. But I think, you know, he uh, we we just need him on that first line. We need Jakey Need there, especially because Wingard is getting this time in the midfield, and you know we need that guy down there at every opportunity. You know, to scrap every every ball that might come loose, or at least try to. I think he needs to be a part of it. And uh, yeah. yeah, just seeing him back. I didn't even talk about uh, him coming, his playing in the game. He was a great part of the game. You know, he uh, kicked a couple of goals, didn't he? Was it two two or maybe a bit more? Yeah, he kicked two uh, two. Two two. Yeah. yeah. He was a live wire. It was good to watch him out there again, despite the rain. It was good. He was worth it. Let's see. And your hate? My hate. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my hate. I kind of thought of. Uh, the idea of an Eddie had elimination final, that's my hate, I think. Just thinking about how our season's kind of shaping now towards the end. The idea of, you know, we had an idea of playing Adelaide at Adelaide Oval, hosting one of these guys. Now he could be travelling, at worst case scenario, to, you know, travelling to Melbourne is okay if you're going to the G, but if you're going to Eddie had, it's not a good trip compared to potentially playing in front of 50,000 of your own fans. I'm going to yeah, fill up your wine glass, Simba, so you're a little bit more fuller. So yeah. uh, you can be half full as well. It's not we all over. We should still be able to do it. We should still be able to stay home for the first week of finals, but it would it would be unfortunate if we were to travel anywhere, but Etihad's not a fun place to go. Well, I, honestly, I, I can't see us going below six, to be honest. I just think there's so many... those That seventh to... 11th position at the moment they're all so even they're going to be fighting for points and they're going to be brutalizing themselves to try and get into the finals uh you know all the way down to west coast and richmond are still a fair chance now um they're going to steal points off of each other and i just even if we just tumbled with only one win i I just can't see them uh, being able to catch us so we should finish between fourth and six as far as i'm concerned so i don't think it's all doom and gloom mate I'd expect us to finish fifth at the lowest. Um, I can't really see North jumping us. They'd have to beat the Crows to do that, and I think the Crows might get them. I reckon it's going to be uh, two home um, finals at Adelaide Oval in the first week, <laughs> which is what the amazing. SANFL and AFL would want, really. That'd be amazing. Mm. That would be a huge win for us, for the state. How would they it fixture would, that yeah. one? Oh, you'd... I reckon it would be Crows on the Friday night and us on the uh, Saturday afternoon. And as we continue to hijack Simba's uh, hate here, um, <laughs> I guess if you're talking about fixtures and crowds of 50,000, uh, I noticed today someone posted up that Port's in the uh, the top four average attendance for the year. Yeah. That's fantastic. So let's, uh, let's turn your frown upside down and turn it into another love. <laughs> what about numbers? They're the numbers we want to see. We want to be known up as one of the league bosses, not just uh, as a boss. As you know, my original love was Jakey Need as well, but I've changed it to uh, Travis Boak's leadership, which I thought was fantastic. Um, on the night, I thought he had a, a reasonably quiet first half, but he went absolutely bang in that third quarter and, and really tried to will us across the line um, and get us back in that game You know, with two fantastic goals. Um, yeah. He, he sort of spent more time on a forward flank, I thought, in the second half and just dominated um, that second half of footy. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get up. Um, you know, ever since taking on the captaincy, he's he's grown another leg, Travis Boak, and you know, he's very fast becoming my favourite ever Port Adelaide captain. Jeez. Big call. Big call, mate. Big I'll call. Make, we've we've sure. had some brilliant captains, and, and he's sure right up there. And my hate is... Uh, Probably a, a pretty obvious one. It's going to be the lack of composure um, and execution of skills. Um, not just yesterday's game, but, you know, it's something that's sort of plagued us the last two months. Um, I'm not sure what's happened with our skill level, but it, it's gone downhill greatly in that time. Um, I think this is probably the third game this year where we've really cost ourselves um, the win with poor kicking for goal. Um, but you just can't dominate, you know, a five, six, seven minute period and not score a goal. Absolutely. Mm. Well, it kills the momentum, doesn't it? It does. I mean, that third quarter, that start of the third quarter, we were well on top of the Swans. Um, 
and you know we we dominated for five minutes and had probably five shots on goals and got a return of two points and they went mm. straight down the other end and, and kicked a, a goal and you could mm. almost sense the uh, the deflation of the lungs of, of everybody at the ground mm. no. yeah those killer they, those return goals you know when we would miss a chance and they would go and bang get six more points on the board that was very annoying yep no yeah, bad kicking's bad football and of course, the game we're talking about is uh, Port versus Sydney. Uh, we lost by 26 points, 7 goals, 16 uh, to 12 goals, 12. Uh, Travis Spoke and Jakey Knee kicked 2 goals each. Um, where did it go wrong for Port Adelaide this week? I, ca- I called it the 5% Macca. I thought we were just... We were just 5% not good enough in all facets of the game uh, compared to Sydney. And I think that's, in the end, reflected in the scoreline. Um, I think Sydney were just a little bit more smarter structurally around the around the packs. They were a little bit more efficient with the clearance of their ball movement. Uh, they were a little bit more efficient than us in getting clear men. Um, and obviously, they were a little bit more efficient than us in front of the scoreboard. I mean, if you looked at the stats, we dominated most of the stats that mattered, except for maybe the tackles and the wump centers, the little things. Um, but overall, um, yeah, they just did things a little bit better than what we did. It was just a senior side, you know. It, fr- from the bounce, you could see it was a senior side going about their business, and uh, we were always kind of playing catch up, weren't we? Even though we led, we led the first at quarter time, I think. But uh, it's just uh, you could always see we were kind of. Uh, s- scrapping to stay in the battle because when you come up against a team like that, as, and we're still a young team, so you can't expect us to you know, be, be bossing it every minute for the fourth quarter uh, until the fourth quarter end with a team like that. But, uh, yeah, it's just it's hard, it's hard to keep up with a team like that, really. Yeah. Oh, no, it's just uh, it's funny because the game at the SCG... We, we were the two hottest teams in the competition and we kind of played on this similar level. But now, you know, we've dropped off that little bit. Sydney have gained even more momentum. It shows that, you know, we're a long, young side that can drop off and they're a established side that can only get stronger. And that's just, you know, you could tell from the bounce that was really where it, where we, uh, where it's at, you know? Yep. No, you're right. As you said, Rick, um, you know, we won all the stats that we probably needed to that we spoke about in the preview. Um, and we kind of mirrored that effort, what we did in that earlier game at the SCG. You know, we won the hitouts quite convincingly. Hitouts to advantage was a, a huge differential. We won the clearances, won the contested possessions, won the disposals. Um, but we just couldn't, um, we just couldn't use the ball effectively at all. You know, we had nine less inside fifties, which is pretty damning when you win um, the hitouts and the clearances quite convincingly. But I think part of the part of the problem is uh, we keep we keep coming back to this lamentable uh, uh, lack of forward structure. And I mean, if you look at the Sydney goals, they were able to uh, either isolate their forwards one on one, or or just create space for their forwards to run into open goals for the, the majority of all their goal scoring opportunities. Um, and I think one of the biggest criticisms of our game uh, for the last two months since we've dropped off has been our lack of uh, forward efficiency, which was so pronounced in the first half of the year. And uh, I guess it was noticeable again last night, our lack of leading uh, forward targets. Uh, we just don't seem to be leading to the ball. I don't I don't know why. Um, is it a bit of, you know, are we lacking that bit of courage? Are our kickers uh, not making the players lead? Are the, are the opposition teams filling our uh, inside uh, 50 forward space uh, efficiently well? Uh, causing problems for us, but um, that's the, a real bugbear of mine. And I don't think, even think it's the tall forward issue now. It's just the forwards that are there aren't leading. Yeah, it's it's not even tall forwards. It's just every forward. Um, there's, yeah, I mean, I can't recall the last time we've actually led sort of from the forward line and, and someone's taken a mark mm-hmm. 25 metres out in front and, and kicked a goal. You know, it hasn't happened for weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and the best we looked, um, I thought, was in the first quarter when we had more of a traditional structure. We started with Trengove up forward, so we had three three tolls up forward. We had the three smalls up there as well. Um, you know, they were they were crowding that forward 50. We were playing a traditional structure, and it looked pretty good. You know, we were able to win the ball and get it forward, and they were they were doing some damage. 
And what did you boys okay. think of uh, Trengo that forward? I didn't yeah, mind it, but I thought he uh, I thought he ran out of puff pretty obviously reasonably early on, um, which kind of cost us a little bit. He then moved back and, and did a reasonable job, um, sort of covering down back for a little bit of a uh, little bit of time there, and then he got subbed off. He might well shore up our forward line a little bit, but um, at the end of the day, when he does take those marks, which he would be up there to take, he uh, you don't really rely on him too much to actually slot the goal, which is another little problem if you want to change the game, change the game up and put a defender up there. He actually has to be able to you know somewhat do that role. I mean, he is very good at making the contest and everything, and he can take the mark, but you know it's not Jacko's fault anyway. Everybody. Um, Everyone kind of has the yips in front of goals or something. Well, this is this is a problem I said to Macker. I mean, um, Jacko's uh, efficiency for shooting a goal from 50 metres plus out probably isn't his forte, but um, our probably our Achilles heel with our forwards at the point in time is um, uh, Robbie Gray, Angus Mumphreys, Justin Westoff, uh, all very shaky set shots on goal at the moment. Um, which is a bit of a concern for us, uh, you know, because you can't have that many forwards uh, being so unreliable. They're, they're momentum killers in the game, and it, it's something that we need to address. And they're all they're all experienced players, so I can't see how they're going to be able to change that in their game either at this point in time of their careers. Yep. Yeah, I mean, when when the ball's at ground level and one of them is around looking around to snap the goal, I'm very confident that one that one of them is going to do it, whoever it is. But yeah, when it comes to the set shot, you just you, you're pretty sure you're just going to get a point from that. Yeah, I mean, back to the game style for a little bit. I almost feel like we're shitting on our own doorstep a little bit because we want to play this sort of slingshot footy, but I think we need a lot of space to do that to open up the game and, and use our pace to our advantage. But when you're putting all of our 18 players and therefore 36 players in one half of the ground, it just creates too much congestion, and you don't you're not able to run it out um, as effectively as you want to be able to do it. Yeah. And then when we actually do win the ball, you've got no one to kick to. So you've just got to rely on constantly kicking to people running with the flight of the ball, which is fine, but it, it involves a lot of pinpoint accuracy and we just don't have the skill level to pull that off. But, I mean, to the coach's defence at this point in time, um, it seems to be a game style that everyone seems to be adopting. I mean, I was watching the uh, the West Coast game earlier and also uh, the Crows game earlier today as well. And uh, it, there seems to be a lot of empty uh, paddocks uh, at one end of the ground. And, and then the forwards are basically running back uh, to our goals and then having to do a quick flip around. Now, I'm not saying that that's right in, in relation to the game style, but it seems to be a game style that everyone's adopting. And I guess the problem is we've lost the effectiveness of being able to do it. And... Sydney, with their two key targets, are, are probably the only team at the moment that's willing to run the gauntlet and leave a forward isolated in their inside 50 to allow for their team to have someone to pass to. Yeah, we're just uh, struggling. We're, we're, we've got the game plan where we need to be able to make that space for ourselves, but we just can't do it at the moment, especially uh, against some of the sides that know that we're trying to do that now. Yeah, well, I, th I don't think our forwards are actually flipping back around and leading to the ball. So they're, they're sort of just timing their run to just run with the ball and sort of run onto it. It's almost like we're trying to play long ball, EPL style, uh, yeah. you know, which was EPL in the 80s and, uh, <laughs> you know, just kick it, kick it long and, uh, and just run onto it. And, uh, you know, I think we've lost that little bit of effectiveness. And I'm with you, Macca. I don't know if our forwards are maybe just pressing too high up with this zone and uh, they need to maybe drop back another 20 metres in the zone and give themselves a bit more time to be able to run back into the 50. And, you know, or are we spreading maybe? Uh, I know one of the Sydney posters pointed it out in the game day thread. Um, are, we, uh, you know, are we spreading a little bit too early, uh, too often, which means then our structure's out of place? And, and that was one thing I noticed with, with Sydney. They, they really timed their run and carry. Uh, perfectly last night. They had the right numbers around the ball, around the stoppages or at the contest and then yeah. were able to have that linkage play. Um, we seem to be uh, mistiming our judgment a little bit when it comes to that sort of transitional play and I think that's causing <coughs> us to be out of whack. And we're still not taking the first option instinctively yeah. all the time as well. 
The uh, the target man, the EPL target man thing you said was funny because that's what I was sort of thinking during the game. I was thinking it's like we're using, we're trying to use guys like Need at times or Monfries, who's not very dependable for that thing, on um, as these targets, you know, just to get the ball up to and hold it up. But you're just not very confident on them grabbing the ball, especially if they're in a contest where they're outnumbered. Uh, yeah, it's like uh, you need to find that outlet, unless it's and then and unless it's Schultz, you're not very confident that we have the outlets at the moment to get our game plan rolling. And you look at the other team that we were playing on the night; they have all of these players that can um, that can fulfil that position. You know, Goods, Franklin. Uh, they had Reed and Tippett, who weren't as good as the first two. And even Jetta, I thought, did that role really well. I mean, he kind of, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we're just lacking a bit it's of courage. It's a very well dreamed team, Sydney. Yeah, yeah. We were, we're just delivering into the pockets, you know, when we could deliver front and centre a goal and make the forwards, you know, still have an attempt. I mean, Mackie, you pointed, said it a couple of weeks ago, the Choco S game plan. And, you know, that's what we were notorious for with Choco, just get the stoppage in the pocket, you know, and it seems to be we're sort of sucking back into that style instead yep. of just let's deliver to the top of the square and have the courage that our our forwards are either going to take a mark or create a contest and uh, and then we get a stoppage out in front of goal and we seem to be a little bit afraid to do that at the moment. Yeah. Well, as I said, it's pooping on our own doorstep a little bit because we look up, we try and play through the corridor, we look up, there's no one there, so we've got to kick it sideways. We have a little bit of a run down the wing and then we just hoof it long into the pocket because there's no one else to kick to and hope that it goes yeah. out of bounds. You know, you know, it's not really a game style that's going to win you a lot of games. No, but look, to counter that, I thought there was a lot of positives to come out of last night. Oh, absolutely, I, uh, there was. I thought we, I thought we were moving the ball faster than what we have in previous weeks. I thought our our major ball winners and leaders were starting to step up again. So, you know, your Robbie Gray, your Travis Boak, your Jared Pollock, um, you know, your Hamish Hartlett, Braddy, but they they were starting to collect more ball and. And at most of the time, not all the time, they, they were using it a lot better. Uh, we seem to be a bit more crisper with the ball in the general play um, compared to what we have in the previous weeks. We weren't handballing uh, low to the feet or, or missing our targets. We were starting to deliver our targets, which was great. And probably the rain was a bit, little bit detrimental to us in that third quarter. That sort of probably um, you know, hampered our, our movement a little bit. Um, you know, Matt Loby stood up and, and played a great game last night, um, was more influential in, around the ground and in the ruck and, uh, you know, really took that burden. He looked a lot fresher. So, uh, yeah, for, and even and Matty Broadbent was one of his better games for probably the last couple of months as well. And, and our defensive four, I think, is worth touching on. You know, Jack, Jackson really uh, didn't have a massive influence with the defence, but, you know, all the boys stood up in that, uh, in that defence last night. No, you're right. Yeah, there, there was certainly was a lot to like about that game. Um, for me, it, I was really impressed with our effort. I thought we really gave it a red-hot crack. And you know what? I think um, this time next year, that's a game that we're going to win. I think we'll have that uh, that little extra bit of composure. Um, we'll get our foot skills right, and we will win those sort of games next year. Yeah, we'd, I'd be Hopefully hoping so. As soon as next year. That would be beautiful. Yeah, it'll be... It'll be next year. Because we're not I, far off. We're not far off uh, at all. As you said, it's just 5% off. You know, we, we I mean, kick look, those goals in the third quarter. You know, we, we get the yeah. score line back to evens and it's anyone's game. I mean, Brereton uh, summed, summed it up well at the start of the year. You know, he, he thought that we weren't going to make the finals. He, he was expecting a bit of a lull uh, from us as a team with the younger players. and uh, But his opinion was, you know, if we were a share... You'd want to invest in us now for next year because there's a lot of upside. And we've still got that upside. And a lot of these young boys are going to have more mature bodies and going to be able to carry the workload of a season a lot more uh, efficiently. So, um, you know, it's, there is upside to our story to tell. And, and one of the biggest upside, upsides, I think, is uh, Homsch. I thought he was fantastic last night. And some of his courage at attacking the contest and, and getting the ball was just magnificent and very courageous. Yep. That's probably his best game of footy, I reckon. Yeah. On that member's Homsch. wing. Amazing. You know, how he just 
took the courage to run off Frank, Franklin and, uh, you know, and just leap strong and hard and, and take that mark, you know, it was, you know, we had a perfect uh, angle from where we were sitting and it was just an amazing vision. Homs was just beautiful to watch. He was, you had to be so confident looking every time he was at a one-on-one or even outnumbered. Every time the ball was coming over where Homs was involved, you just thought, Homs, he's going to get another one out of there. Uh, and yeah, as you mentioned, that back four, you know, that team within a team, as Kenny called them, they're so, they're really getting a good bond together. You can, and it's all pretty much led by Bobby Carlisle, you know, the, the senior man back there. And if we are going to be tilting for a flag soon, it has to be pretty soon with guys like Carlisle and Schultz really in their prime. I mean, they're our full back and our full forward. Um, they're pretty much the biggest parts of our team almost. The midfield is coming together. And if we're going to serve those two players, it has to be pretty pretty soon. I'm pretty sure Bobby's only 26, isn't he? I think, um, yeah, he's like 27 and Schultz is 29, I think, or 26 yeah. or 27 and 29. So, so Bobby, Bobby's in his physical prime for probably another four years now. Um, yeah, Schultz is, you know, with his hardness of his game, he's probably getting closer to, to burnout, burnout, I would imagine. But... Um, uh, I just thought it was noticeable with Bobby and, and Jackson back in the side. Jonas and Homch both had much more polished games uh, compared to what they've had in the last four weeks. I mean, uh, I thought Jonas was in pretty average form the last month and uh, he was back to his one of his better games again as well last night. So, you know, adding that structure back makes an amazing difference. And, and we're not Hawthorne. You know, we don't, we don't have the experience um, in our team yet where we can lose two key defenders and the other players know the structure inside out uh, that they can compensate that. So for us that with a younger side, losing two key defenders really does throw our structures out quite uh, significantly. And uh, and I still think part of it, uh, we've been a little bit unlucky with the timing of our illness as well because, you know, I think if we played like that last week, we would have beaten Collingwood. And, you know, so having a significant amount of the side um, under an injury or illness cloud last week, which really hampered our performance, probably really affected us a little bit. Uh, where's Angus Monfries at? Because I thought he was a, a fair bit disappointing last night. He hasn't had a great year. Um, you know, he just couldn't get the ball at all last night, and Malcheski ran off him um, and, and was one of the best players on the ground. He's such an important part of that forward structure we talk about. He He's, I reckon, the... He's one of the main men you have to look at when you're thinking, why are we not going as well as we could? I mean, there are so many reasons, but that position that he plays, he has to be performing better because at the moment it's to our detriment. And as well as the second tall as well, the first tall is doing everything he can. Uh, what's, that going, what's going on with the gas? Nobody knows. Well, I think it's all the forwards. You know, yeah. They've all picked up injuries and they've all picked <clears> up niggles and... You know they were our major leading targets, and we were dominating marks inside fifties. And now, and now we really come back to the field in that in that key statistic. So, you know, are the injuries at these and these rolled ankles that the the boys have, uh, um, you know, endured during the season? Is that really starting to hamper hamper their uh, their mobility in the game? Because uh, that's you know, we'll go back to what we we're talking about before. It's the Bermuda Triangle of our game at the moment our lack of leading forwards, which we were so good with at the beginning of the year. But, I mean, what do you do? Do you? He's a great player. Do you drop him? Same with Brad Ebert, people criticising Brad Ebert. He's a great player, and they, they, want, they want him dropped. I mean, you know, a few weeks ago, that would have been a ridiculous call. But, I mean, who do you, who, who's burning the house down at SANFL level to, to drop them? You know, I mean, is Sam Gray going to be a, a Brad Ebert replacement? Probably not. Uh, Montfrey's replacement, maybe, um, you know, but it's questionable. And it's the same with Pittard. Well, we've being... got Matty White to come back in the side as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. So you would but think I mean, I... Uh, White for Montfrey's would be a like-for-like like sort of change there. I don't know how you guys found it, but I found it quite ironic that Impey got dropped and Pittard was on the bench as sub and probably what hurt us the most was their two small forwards in uh, Buddy McGlynn and is it Cunningham? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very strange choice of sub. I, I didn't agree with that at all. Especially with Impey no. out of the side. We, we we probably did need Impey playing, to be honest. But um, if you're going to drop Impey, Pittard was essential to play in that, that full game, I would have thought. 
Yeah, well, they, they're small forwards twice a new one, especially yeah. McGlynn in the first half. You know, it was like, who's on that guy? Nobody. <laughs> and it's mm. like, where's our small defenders? Oh, one's in the SA NFL and the other one's sitting on the pine. Yeah, and I guess the other person that was probably disappointing, and, and there's one that I really want to grasp uh, their opportunity, was Andrew Moore. It's two games in now, and, and both games uh, he's been a little bit fumbly and underperforming, and uh, and this comes back to earlier in the season where I was really saying, I want these boys to take their opportunities and to say, this is my spot, and I want to keep it. Yeah, you would think he could be a candidate to take that Monfries position, but not on the form that he has shown. But uh, it, it, it really is a case of uh, people were saying you can't put Butcher in or you can't put these young players in too late now because everything's, you know, everything's in motion late in the season. And you can sort of see that with Moore. He, he's not just going to slot into the AFL team because he has very good SANFL form. It, you can see through Moore how hard it is to actually get, get into the groove at that level. I thought Moore with the ball in his hand was pretty decent. Um, my main issue with him was just he's far too loose defensively. Um, again, he's, I thought he played on Kennedy in that first half and just got torn to pieces. Um, then he got moved to a half-back flank and just gets caught ball-watching too much and loses his opponent. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, think it's Sim- I was just going to say, as you said, Simba, I think it's a good argument to, for people that want to keep... Um, making massive changes week in, week out, uh, which Hinkley doesn't want to do, is you need to give these players time to find their feet in the structure and also pick up the pace of AFL football. He's not the only one out there that doesn't have quite have the skills to pull off what he wants to do and what what we are in position to do. It's just, you know, like you mentioned, the, uh, the 5% off, we're just 5% off, you know, actually uh, taking the bull by the horns doing what we know we can do. I mean, I guess okay. I was actually, if I, I didn't have time today, but one thing I was going to do, I was going to pick out a game from earlier in the season and watch it and try and compare the difference other outside of the Brisbane game, which in Bulldogs, which is a bit of an anomaly, um, you know, probably the Frio or the Geelong or the Hawthorne game, um, and just see where the difference is in our game <laughs> at the moment. But... You know, if I think back to the first half of the season, we just seemed to be a little bit more well-organised. We were the team defensively structured where we were able to have that second chop-out guy coming into the contest. And so our defensive structure of sweeping the ball and moving it back forward was fantastic. And we just seemed to have lost a little bit of confidence there. And uh, we don't we don't seem to have that defensive structure. And I think part of it is we still don't have that forward pressure our forwards aren't locking the ball inside our forward 50 and, and putting that aggressive tackling pressure on as we were at the start of the season. I'm going to disagree with a the part there. I think our defensive structures are pretty good. And, you know, guys like O'Shea and Broadbent have cut off those forward attacks, you know, with a lot of skill and class over the last few weeks. Um, I think our issue is that when we actually win the ball back, we just can't use it effectively. You know, we turn it over either two or three or disposals down the line. Whereas earlier in the year we were, you know, we were hitting those targets and getting it inside fifty and getting it deep inside fifty as well. Mm. Whereas now we're sort yeah, of like... turning it, turning it over across half order or, or across the centre line, because um, we're just missing targets too much. Absolutely, and when we've got that offensive run going and you miss a target, you're all out of whack in the zone. I guess what I was, what I'm more talking about is our mopping up. You know, we we had extra numbers. At the, uh, at the fall of the ball, and we had a system in place. Now, I just don't think we're as efficient now uh, with that structure as what we were at, at the other, at earlier times of the year. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, we're still getting well, look, maybe, there. Maybe the team is literally fatigued and, um, yeah. and, and pretty spent. I think, I think we are, to be honest. I think we are struggling. Um, I don't know if we're completely cooked and... Well, we can quite easily turn it with our form, and this is where we're in this little vex situation now because the the law is that, you know, we can go back and compare to the first 14 games and go, well, if we can put that on, we'll be fine. The question is, can we do it? But the next three games are winnable games for us, and top four spot would be ours if we can do it. Mm. Next week is crucial. If we can't beat the Suns, you know, uh, what chance do we have? I mean... Oh, it's season oh, over if we don't beat Gold Coast. Yep. Really season crazy. over. 
Well, it is really. Yeah, if we can't get over Gold Coast, that means we've won what one game in the last eight or nine games, uh, which was yeah. a two-point win against Melbourne. Yeah, we won't be winning finals um, if we can't. Yeah, if we we've got to find some sort of winning form before the finals to bring in some sort of confidence because we can't go into the finals, um, you know, having lost eight or nine games in a row or something crazy like that. It's just not going to happen. Could this end up having a damaging effect on our players' psyche potentially for next year? I don't think so. No, I don't think so at all. I think we know that we're not too far off. Again, we didn't lose by much. You know, we haven't lost by much all this year. You know, we're so, so close to putting it all together. It wouldn't surprise me at all if we come out next year and dominate the competition um, for, the, for the entire year because we are so, so close to doing that. It's just about putting those pieces together. I reckon we're going to go over there and, and win. We're going to be the hunter again. We're being, we've been the hunted for too long now. It's getting a bit annoying. Yeah. But over there, you know, Hinkley's going to know that this is the game, you know, and we've got Carlton after that. We can build some momentum by winning two out of the last three or giving, our best, uh, giving us our best opportunity to win three out of three if we do win those first two because he knows that that last one in Fremantle was the toughest. He knows that this one now is probably the the one we can really get the four points most comfortably, if any of them are comfortable. Um, mm. well, look, the good thing it. is the good thing is that the status quo remains from this time last week. Frio lost. You know, we're all in the same position. We're all just one win out of um, you know out of the top four. It's still very much on the cards. We just got to find that confidence in what we're doing on field, hitting those targets, kicking those goals, um, and running with it, basically. Just finding that extra 5%. That's it. And I think, like you said, it is the fatigue a little bit. I mean, um, you know, everyone was saying it was our speed that would get us, that would really make us break those lines. And it was, you know, Matty White, Jared Polek's leg, left leg. Um, but now it's obvious that, you know, we've slowed down a little bit. And as well as those contests have become tougher, people have you know, tried to grind us down a lot more. They know what we're trying to do with those outside players. We have to find maybe plan B and C a little bit. Well, look, who were your best players, Rick? Oh, I had uh, I had Robbie Gray uh, as best on ground. Uh, I thought he had a fantastic game. Um, clean hands, uh, good use of the ball, except for his uh, set shots. Uh, Trevor Spoke. Um, another fantastic captain's uh, performance. Um, yeah, he's a wonderful leader, as you said, Macker, and a uh, uh, true champion of the club now. Uh, and well done to him. And uh, I had Homch and uh, Carlisle <laughs> as third and fourth. Uh, I thought they had uh, great games. You know, Carlisle dominated a tippet once again, made him redundant, subbed him out of the game. And uh, Homch was unlucky. Um, you know, with that push in the back, Franklin really should have only had one goal. And uh, yeah, and I, I gave Matty Broadbent uh, uh, one vote. I thought he came back to form and, and had a great game as well. Yep. I like it. What about you, Simba? Yeah, um, <clears throat> Boak and Gray, they were, they were stars out there. They were obvious superstars. Um, and Homs as well. They were my three. And I had need around the mark. Um, you know, Boak, Rob... Travis Spoke and Robbie Gray, you can't really go past those two. They were immense in there. In, in tight, you know, it doesn't matter how tight it is. They can, both his, his evasive skills are not too far behind Gray, even though Gray looks more dazzling. But Boke is such a powerful unit and such a classy unit as well. He's awesome to watch in there. Uh, I've stolen your three. Is there anyone else I can pick out of there? And I want to give a point to Jakey Need just because it was good to see him back. It was. It was great to see Needy back. Um, I actually chose uh, Jackie Homsch as best on ground because I thought he did such a fantastic job on Franklin. Um, you know, he is the most explosive key forward in the game. When Jack went to him um, in the first quarter, I thought, God, I'm not sure this is going to end well because I didn't think Homsch had the pace to go with him. Um, but he certainly had the pace to go with him and not just um, to go with him. But he was... Um, he was going past him um, in some of those sort of long-running stretches as well. Um, as said, Rick, you know, one of Franklin's goals, you know, came from one of the most ridiculous decisions I've ever seen on a footy field before. 
or non-decisions, I guess you'd call it. Um, he was fantastic, and look, he's going to be an absolute superstar for us for a, for a decade. Jackie Holmes, she's got you know the world at his feet, really. Um, I had Robbie Gray as second best on ground. Just you know, it was great to see him recapture that form um, after a, a bit of a down week last week. Travis spoke. I already spoke about him in the love hate. Um, his captain's performance in the second half really gave us a chance of winning the game. Um, I had Tommy Jonas as fourth best. Um, I thought his job on Goods was fantastic. Um, Goods was someone that really destroyed us earlier in the year, and you know he kept him to no influence at all. Um, and Matty Loby in the ruck, you know, just a fantastic ruck performance. Um, probably the best hit outs to advantage differential he's had in his career. Um, really killed Mike Pike um, and fed our uh, midfield as well. Good goal. He was awesome to watch. And uh, Homps, yeah. Um, man, what was I going to say about him? <laughs> I just lost my train of thought thinking about Loby. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, he just looked so cool and composed, didn't he? His face never looked, he never looked worried, he never looked beaten, he always looked composed, he always looked like like a senior player out there. Yeah, he's very cool under pressure, Jackie boy. Now let's uh, have a quick chat about the SANFL, it was a... Uh, Another heartbreaking loss there. We lost by three points in what's probably going to be one of the games of the season um, against Central Districts at Elizabeth Oval on Saturday. We lost 15 goals, 11 to 16 goals, eight. Um, you know, we were we were 42 points down at half time, which is a massive margin. We came out in the third quarter and just dominated, kicked eight goals to one, and actually led at, at uh, three quarter time. Um, into the last change there. Central's uh, got back on top in the last quarter. They, I think they got out to a 21-point lead there at one stage. The game looked over. Um, then Port, as we are, as we normally do, you know, we came again, kicked three goals in, in about three minutes, um, right at the death there to actually lead by three points with two minutes left. Um, then Kyle Jenner, uh, the ex-Port Magpie uh, lad, mm. he, uh, he got a free kick with about five seconds left, a, a bit of a contentious one. Um, and slotted a goal from 40 metres straight in front, and the siren blew as the ball was in the air. Nice. Heartbreak. And not, not, and not nice. That's I, it. I was, it was noticeable when we were talking uh, before the game, Macca, that um, Brendan Archie stood up to the plate and uh, had a good game this week. He did. He's uh, continued on his fantastic form. Uh, 28 touches and three marks. Uh, Tommy Logan was the clear best on ground. He had 40 touches and 18 marks, which is ridiculous. Also kicked two goals. He really dominated that midfield well. Is there a spot for um, Tommy in our side at the moment? I mean, it's tough. I mean, I, I think our defensive group is pretty settled. We've still got Impy to come back in. Um, I'm not sure there is. Could he Could he maybe play a defensive Sorry, forward Simba. role? A defensive forward uh, role, uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe Mo- maybe Monfrey's role. Yeah, he's mm. done that before and not really succeeded in that role, I don't think. He does like to take a hanger. No, does, not it is hard to squeeze him in there, though, especially because that unit, you know, we've only really seen one or two changes to it every week and we've, we always like to see the same four or five guys back there. And yeah. uh, if Logan hasn't cemented a spot already... He, uh, you know, they like to be complemented with young players, I guess, like Pidard O'Shea, Oimpi. Uh, there's, there's always a spot for Logan somewhere, somehow, though. He, he gives everything every time he's out there. Not, not really a sub, but I don't know. We'll see. If you can't get back in the side this week, though, then surely there's, with two games to the left, there's probably little chance. But he'll, he'll, he'll go like a wrecking ball through the SANFL finals. Yeah, I've been I've been impressed with him as an SANFL player for us this year. Though he's really he's really stepped up as a leader at the Maggies, and he you know he had that infamous chat with Ken about limited opportunities, but this is what he's got to do, and he's he's really uh, taken to that role. And uh, you know, all credit to him. You know, not sulking, and he's just doing what he's got to do. A great club man. Um, so so hats off. Yeah. Um, who were our goal scorers for the game? Well, look, Sammy Gray kicked three goals. Um, he also had 20 touches. Uh, Cam Hitchcock, his first game back for about four months, two goals. Um, great to see him back playing footy again. Um, I Anthony heard you were Beeman's, pretty excited. 
I was very excited about Hitchy. Good on him. It's good to have him back. And uh, Anthony Beeman's kicked two, um, including, uh, I think it was two in the last quarter. He kicked uh, two of those three goals in three minutes there. Um, and Tommy Logan kicked two as well. And did our flying Finn have a uh, influential game? Uh, Flynn, you mean? Flynn. Flynn uh, the... Flying Flynn, no, he did not. No, he played on Bryce uh, Retzlaff, who's uh, quite a bit taller and stronger than him. Yes. Um, and he kicked four goals and, and had quite a great influence on the game. Right. It's a bit of a shame. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure Daniel Flynn is suited to playing at fullback, no. So. No. Mm. I'd still like to see him maybe in a forward pocket mm. leading up at the ball. Yeah, I'd like to see him on a wing. I reckon he'd, he'd be a great midfielder. Yeah, we're on the wing. Do you think Sam Gray will get any more time with the power this year? Do you think Need will stay in the side? I think Need will stay in the side this week after his uh, after his performance on the weekend. Sam Gray will be around the mark, I think, but I'm not sure he'll get back in. We've still got Matty White to come in, Aaron Young as well. Um, you know, I think Sam Gray would mm. probably be sort of three, four or five players down the line there um, for a recall. Yeah, got to agree with that one, Macca. It might be tough. Definitely Matt White's going to be an automatic inclusion and, and by the sounds of it, uh, Young might be an automatic inclusion as well. I, I think they both make us better. I mean, White obviously does, but I think Aaron Young is... Uh, I'm excited bringing him back into the side as well. Yeah, we need his uh, his strength around the bowl and his uh, contested ball winning ability and clearance winning ability as well. Well, I saw in the highlights that Cracker, I think, uh, he, yeah, he scored a nice goal. So I wondered, um, guys like Cracker and Impy, I wonder if they have a free roll back in their Santa Fe. Well, I know Cracker is still a magpie, but... Um, he was uh, obviously up front for a bit on the weekend. It made me wonder if we brought Cracker in onto the list, even as a rookie or whatever, and we played him at AFL level, would it necessarily be down back like MP has been playing, or would he? Would we release the Kraken? I think if we're going to draft him, we're going to draft him as, uh, as backup for that defensive group, to be honest. I'd love to see what he could do on a wing or on a, on a forward flank, um, just because of his good skills and, and goal-kicking ability. Um but I do think if we're going to draft him, it's going to be as backup for that defensive group. Right. Well, Simba, thanks for coming on, mate. Uh, it was great to have you on for your first time on the podcast. No worries. Thanks. It was good to talk to you too. And Rick, as always, Just mate. Pleasure, buddy. Always a good one. Hopefully uh, we'll be reviewing a, a more positive tone next week. Absolutely. Until next week, boys. Go Port Adelaide. Yes. Go Port Adelaide. Go Port. Seabarn now caught. Port Adelaide are beginning to build. Foster's kick is through half forward. Knocked away by Hodges. On the run is Rowan Smith. Bends it to the goal square. And puts it through. Oh, a fantastic goal. Rowan Smith's first. And they're the sort of games that win matches.